But uh, anyway, uh, let's go to the Lord in prayer again, and then we're going to open up the Word of God this morning. Father, I just want to thank you, Lord, for the wonderful opportunity we always have to gather in this place as brothers and sisters in Christ, bound together by the blood of Jesus. Lord, we, we gather in your name, and we ask your spirit, God, to be here, to fill our hearts and lives, of course, but to fill this room with your presence, Lord, so that we can leave this morning saying it was good to be in the house of the Lord. We thank you, Father, so very much for the opportunity now to open your word. And we pray, Father, you'll speak to us through it. Move me out of the way, Lord, and speak clearly to your people. And I pray this, Father, in Jesus' name, amen. Okay, you're doing great with those memory verses, and, and I know you're going to do even better next week with our T-shirts that we have. Faith over fear, I like that, don't you? I mean, that's the way we need to be living as brothers and sisters in Christ. Faith must be preeminent in our lives. Next week, we're going to look at Psalm 29, verse 11, which says, The Lord will give strength unto his people, and the Lord will bless his people with peace. That's an easy one. Uh, I've never preached a sermon, a, a funeral sermon, where I haven't ended that funeral sermon with that verse. That the Lord would bless his people with peace. And we're going to see right now just how much the Lord needed the presence of the Father with him and how much he needed his peace uh, to be with him. The prophet Isaiah said that Jesus was a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. So many things in his life which gave the Lord grief. Uh, the Bible says that he grieved for Israel at their hardness of heart. He was grieved for the struggle of one man who was both deaf and unable to speak. And the Lord's heart went out to him and gave him healing. Jesus was grieved with those who, who wanted simply to argue with him. Jesus was grieved as he stood before the tomb of Lazarus and he just couldn't help himself. And he began to weep. Jesus was grieved as he looked out over Jerusalem. And the Bible says that he wept over it, knowing that its destruction was imminent. But there was no grief to be compared to what the Lord was about to experience in the Garden of Gethsemane. Paul spoke about those days. And he said this about Jesus. He said, in the days of his flesh... He offered up both prayers and supplications with loud crying and tears. Loud crying and tears. What was it that brought the Lord to that place of grief? Some say it was the death on the cross that was looming. The Passover in, in Luke chapter 22 verse 1, the Passover was approaching when God, as promised to Abraham, would provide himself a lamb and Jesus would die on the cross, forsaken of God for the sins of the world. Some say it was the determination of the, the religious leaders in Luke chapter 22 and verse number 2. The Bible says that the chief priests and the scribes were seeking how they might put him to death. They had made up their minds. This was what they wanted to do and were going to do, put Jesus to death. Perhaps it was the defection of Judas. And again, in Luke 22, in verse 3, the Bible says that Satan has entered into Judas and the wheels of betrayal are already turning. It's interesting that during the time when they were gathered together in the upper room, there was a dispute amongst the disciples. Which of them should be the greatest? Imagine that. At that most sacred time, they were concerned about which one of those were going to be the greatest. Perhaps it was the desertion of the disciples that was looming soon. The Bible tells us that they would all flee and run. 
or maybe it was the personal denial of Peter. Soon, Peter would begin to curse and to swear and say, I do not know the man. Any one of those things surely would have broken the heart of Jesus, but there was something far greater that Jesus was about to face. Come with me, if you will, to this garden of Gethsemane. In verse number 39, we see the Lord walking with a purpose according to the plan of God. It says that he came and he came out, that is out of the upper room, and proceeded toward the garden. They left the upper room. The Bible tells us, interestingly enough, that they left singing from the upper room. I have a feeling that was the idea of Jesus to sing. No doubt the disciples were full of wonder. No doubt the disciples were full of fear uh, of themselves. And so Jesus said, well, let's just sing. And so they left the upper room singing, headed straight toward the place, the Garden of Gethsemane, as was his custom to go. Jesus, the Bible says, often resorted there with his disciples. They would go there to rest. They would go there for Jesus to teach them and to pray with them. And, but during this final week before Jesus would die on the cross, each night they would spend there in that garden. That's where they would sleep uh, through the night. Of course, Judas was well aware of that fact. Uh, you remember that the, the priests themselves were looking for a place apart from the crowd where they might arrest Jesus and Judas knew just the place. We're going to be at the Garden of Gethsemane. He knew just the place to take the soldiers to arrest Jesus. Further there in verse 39, it says, And the disciples also followed him. As Jesus left the upper room, he's leading the way, and the disciples are following behind. Have you ever wondered what they must have been thinking as they left the upper room that night? As the Lord has already spoken of his death, the Lord has already spoken of his betrayal. Can you imagine what they were thinking as they headed out into the night? They made their way down through the Kedron Valley, up the other side to the Mount of Olives. What must they have been thinking Perhaps Thomas spoke for them all when Thomas said to his fellow disciples, disciples, let us also go so that we might die with him. And they did follow Jesus. They followed him to Jerusalem. Remember, Jesus had set his face to go to Jerusalem. They had followed Jesus into the temple each day as he went there to teach. They had followed him even into the upper room. They had followed him now unto the garden. Look at verse number 40. We see that now the hour of temptation has come. In verse number 40, it tells us when Jesus arrived at the place, all of the disciples arrived there at the place. Of course, Judas is not there, but they all arrive at the garden, which was, a, a, was surrounded by a stone wall. Eight of the disciples would stay by the gate as instructed by the Lord, but three of the disciples, Peter, James, and John, were invited to come inside the garden uh, with the Lord. But Jesus at this point gives instructions. He gives directions to the disciples. He said to them, Pray that you may not enter into temptation. Pray. Now, he's, he's, he has these people right there in front of him. He has their attention. Pray that you enter not into temptation. Now, Jesus is not asking them to pray an unusual prayer. You remember, don't you, when the disciples came to the Lord and, and said to him, teach us to pray. And in that prayer, Jesus taught them these words. Pray like this, lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. You know, it's time to put the lessons of prayer into practice. It's time to put those lessons of prayer into practice. 
You remember when Jesus was tempted uh, there in the wilderness, the Bible says the Spirit of God drove him into that place. And for 40 days, Jesus fasted and prayed, fasted and prayed. He prayed and he prayed and he prayed. The lesson that we must learn from that is that Jesus would not face temptation without prayer. He would not face temptation without without prayer. Yes, the Bible tells us large crowds were gathering to hear Jesus, but Jesus himself would often slip away into the wilderness to pray. Jesus was not about to face temptation without prayer. Now, what makes you and I think that we can face the temptations of our life without prayer? You know, the disciples were very much like many of us, I'm afraid. They didn't see the need uh, for prayer on this night. Instead, they were filled with self-confidence. Peter kept saying incessantly over and over again, even if I have to die with you, I will not deny you. And they were all saying the same thing, filled with self-confidence. But Peter again, like many of us, would have to learn his lessons the hard way. There would come a time, there would come a place where Peter would cry bitter tears as he learned the lesson. You can't face the temptations of life without prayer. Yes, we can read in in 1 Peter chapter 5 and verse 8 where Peter says, Be on the alert. Your adversary, the devil, goes about as a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. But on this night, Peter was not on the alert and he was easy prey for the enemy. Look at verse 41. And we come now to the place of prayer. And Jesus withdrew from them, that is, he withdrew from Peter, James, and John. They're on the inside of this stoned wall garden. Peter, James, and John are there. But Jesus withdrew from them about a stone's throw. The word withdrew is very important. It means to be drawn away from, drawn away from them. Jesus was drawn from the disciples to the Father to the Father, from them to the Lord. That is the purpose, by the way, of our prayer closet, which Jesus instructed us to have, a place where we can separate ourselves from the world and unto God. And so Jesus finds his place where he can be alone with the Father. Notice in verse 41 also the position of prayer The Bible says that Jesus knelt down and began to pray. He knelt down and he began to pray. Now, of course, there are many ways in which we can pray. Pastors shared this with you before. There there are casual ways that we can pray. We can pray as we drive down the road. Um, I've done that many times. I know you have as well. You can pray uh, lying in your bed. Uh, There are a multitude of ways in, in which you can pray. But honestly, not a lot goes into a prayer like that. And we miss very much when we pray too casually. We miss so much when we are too casual in our prayers. Jeremiah said, you will seek me and find me when you search for me with your whole heart. Your whole heart. Friends, half-hearted prayers are not going to accomplish very much. But on the other hand, the the effectual, fervent prayer of a righteous man will accomplish much. You pour your heart into your prayer. You pour yourself into it. You pour your heart. You pour all that you have into it. It will accomplish much. Sometimes we are just too casual in our prayers. 
There's also the customary prayer. Jesus talked about it in Matthew chapter 6. He says, when you pray, now you, you who are disciples of mine, when you pray, you're not to be like the hypocrites, for they love to stand and pray so that they may be seen of men. That's why they're praying. They want to be seen of men. Friend, do not think very much of a prayer which is really a performance. Don't put a whole lot into that. Don't give a whole lot of credit to that. It may sound pretty. It may sound eloquent. But it's just a performance. And trust me, God knows that it is. But I, I want to point out to you a third way of prayer, and that's the compulsory prayer. And here is Jesus in the garden. And as Jesus begins to pray, he drops to his knees. He just had to do it. There was no one there watching except from a distance, maybe the, the disciples. He just had to drop to his knees. But Mark, in his gospel, tells us more about this prayer of the Lord. Mark tells us when Jesus entered into the place of prayer, he began to be very distressed and troubled on the inside of his heart. There within his heart, there, there was a great burden for what he was about to face. And he said to his disciples, my soul is deeply grieved to the point of death. And he went a little ways beyond and fell to the ground and began to pray. He fell to the ground. The weight of the burden within his heart drove Jesus to the ground. Jesus collapsed under the weight of the burden that was in his heart. Friends, if you have never found yourself on your face before God, don't tell me how much you really care. Here is Jesus filled with the burden and he fell on his face before God. Look at verse 42. In this verse we see the struggle between the flesh and the spirit. Look at verse 42 there. This is a verse that we've heard many, many times but it's so important, and I want us to look at it very closely this morning. First of all, we need to understand that Jesus shrank from this cup, saying, Father, if you are willing, remove this cup from me. If you are willing, remove this cup from me. And friends, this cup is much more than the agony of the cross which Jesus was about to face although that would have been plenty for you and I. Jesus was not praying, Lord, I don't want to go to the cross. Oh, don't let me go to the cross. Oh, please don't. Oh, for this cause he came into the world. Jesus was not praying, I don't want to go to the cross. Look with me into that cup. Look into the cup. David spoke of it. David said, upon the wicked he will rain snares. Fire and brimstone and burning wind will be the portion of their cup. Inside of that cup, David says, there is fire and brimstone and a burning in that cup. David says that this cup is the wrath of Almighty God upon the sins of mankind. Isaiah, the prophet, calls it the cup of God's anger. John, in the book of the Revelation, calls upon those who worship the beast to drink the cup of the anger of God. This cup is the anger of God. It is a cup filled with the anger and the wrath of God over the sin of mankind. Yes, of course, we know that God is long-suffering. We know that God is patient. We know that God wishes for none to perish, but that all would come to the knowledge of the truth. But understand this morning, hear me clearly this morning, God is holy, 
and a holy God cannot tolerate the sin of mankind. God is repulsed by our sin. Our sin to him is an abomination. Here we are today. We have created an image of God according to our own design. We have created an image of God for our own pleasure. We love to talk about the love of God and the peace of God and the mercy of God and the freedom of God. We love all of those parts of God. And somehow we imagine that God does not care about our sin. Think again. Paul, speaking of those who are left out of the kingdom, he says, Let no man deceive you with vain words, empty words, for because of these things comes the wrath of God upon the children of disobedience. The wrath of God will come upon those who disobey the word of God. And further, Paul refers to those who refuse the gospel. Because of your stubbornness and unrepentant heart, you are share, uh, storing up wrath for yourself in the day of wrath and revelation of the righteous judgment of God. For those who refuse the Lord Jesus, understand every day that goes by, every sin that you commit in your life, you are storing up wrath for yourself in the day of God's judgment. Look within your cup and tell me what you see. You may dismiss your sin as nothing, but God does not. And friends, Jesus knew what was in that cup. Jesus knew within that cup was the wrath of Almighty God over all the sins of mankind. And in his flesh, he shrank from it. He pulled back from it. He wrestled with it until finally, praise his name, Jesus surrendered to that cup. And he said, yet not my will, but yours be done. Paul said this about the Lord that God has made him to be sin for us who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. In fact, Isaiah said, the Lord has laid upon him, upon the Lord Jesus, the iniquity of us all. The iniquity of us all. I ask you again this morning, the Bible says, let a man examine himself. I exa ask you this morning to look into your cup. And understand that every lie that you have ever spoken, every look of lust, every longing for something that does not belong to you is in that cup. Go ahead, I challenge you, look into that cup. Within that cup, every act of disobedience, every ounce of hate, every word of gossip and, and hurt is in that cup. Go ahead, if you dare, look into that cup. Every thought of the heart to have its own way. Every time we have persisted in our sin, it is in that cup. Go ahead and look. Every sin, every sin that we have learned to live with, every sin uh, that we want to call normal, every sin upon which the wrath of God will most assuredly fall is in that cup and understand all of it. Every sin of your life, every sin of every man and woman who has ever lived, all poured into the cup of the Lord Jesus. And Jesus surrendered to that cup. Jesus, the Bible says, came into the world to taste death for everyone. When Peter tried to, de to defend the Lord there in the garden with his sword, Jesus asked Peter, the cup which, your father has, which the Father has given me, shall I not drink it? Friends, it was the purpose of the Lord Jesus for which he came into the world to be the Lamb of God without spot or without blemish, to be the Lamb of God who would take away the sins of the world. That was the cup the Lord Jesus. And Jesus is pouring out his heart on his face, on his face, 
on the ground, in the dirt. He's pouring out his heart to God. Not my will, but your will be done. Notice in verse 43, the heavenly help. Now an angel from heaven appeared to him, strengthening him. As Jesus pours himself out before the Father in prayer, remember Jesus had told Peter, James, and John, my soul is deeply grieved to the point of death, and so it was. And you remember also as Jesus was there in the wilderness fasting for 40 days, his flesh was brought to the point of death. How long can you go without eating? A day, two, maybe? You began to get desperate for food. And Jesus went 40 days. His body was the, to the very point of death. Let me ask you this morning, when was the last time, if there has ever been a time in your life when you sought the Lord beyond your physical strength, You can be sure if you will do that, you will find heavenly help. The lesson that we have to learn here in the Garden of Gethsemane is that this battle is not to be fought in the flesh. It is fought in the Spirit. Friends, our prayers are not to be defined by our own physical strength, but our prayers are to be defined by the strength of the Spirit of Almighty God. Think about this for a moment. The book of Hebrews, you read that first chapter of the book of Hebrews, it talks a lot about Jesus as compared to the angels. And it says that Jesus was much better than the angels. It says there that all the angels of God worship him. And now look at this most remarkable fact. Here is Jesus on his face, the Son of God on his face on the ground and one of those angels comes to give him strength to give him help and Jesus is renewed in his strength and what does Jesus do say well that was pretty good I'm going to leave no he doesn't what does Jesus do here he goes right back to prayer In fact, he goes to a deeper place in prayer. He goes to a more intimate place of prayer. Look at verse 44. It says, And being in agony, he was praying very fervently. The word agony here is used only in this place in the entire New Testament. And it speaks of intense effort both mentally and physically. It's a word that is used of athletes. I'm not seeing an athlete in here this morning, but you know what? If a real athlete walked in, you go, whoa. Have you, have you been in the presence of, of a real athlete? And their bodies are just chiseled, and, and you think, well, man, they, they're invincible. And yet, you... You watch a a football game or a basketball game, how many times they have to be carried off of the field because they're hurt? You ever wonder why that is? The reason for it is is because they push their bodies beyond the limit. Beyond the limit. And that's exactly what the Scripture speaks of here. Jesus is pushing himself in prayer beyond the physical limits. He is pushing himself in prayer toward God beyond the limits of his flesh. And look at the result in verse 44, the the appearance of the Lord. And his sweat became like drops of blood falling down upon the ground. His body was literally breaking down under the intense strain of his prayer. And so much so that his appearance began to be distorted and blood began to come forth from his body as if it were sweat. He began to pray more earnestly. That word earnestly speaks, uh, we would use it of a rubber band. You know, you can only pull it so far, right? What's going to happen? It's going to snap. 
And, and Jesus was pushing himself in prayer to the breaking point. Jesus won this battle on his face before God, pushing himself in prayer. When's the last time you've ever done anything even remotely close to that? Oh, you may say a little prayer before you go to bed and back. You really, what you're thinking about, let me get this over so I can get some sleep. When was the last time you pushed yourself in prayer? Here's Jesus on his face before God. Look at verse 45. Let's see how the disciples are doing. When Jesus rose from prayer, he came to the disciples and found them sleeping. Now let's think about that for a moment. When did Jesus sleep? In this week prior to his death on the cross, he spent every day, all day, teaching in the temple and no doubt would spend the evenings in prayer toward God in preparation for what he would teach the next day. On Thursday, the day of the Passover, they prepared it in the upper room. From there, they would go out to the garden. There in the garden, in the middle of the night, Jesus would be arrested and he would be taken to the home of the high priest where he would be tried in the middle of the night. And then the first thing in the morning, Jesus was taken before the Sanhedrin and then he was taken before Pilate and then he was taken to the cross. There wasn't a thought that ever crossed the mind of Jesus. Oh, I could use a little rest. Pilate, could you, could you let me lay down here for a few minutes? Twice already, twice already, Jesus has come to the disciples to wake them up. This time he comes to the disciples and Matthew tells us, he says to them, sleep on now and take your rest. No reason to get up now and pray. The truth is, Peter, James, John, it's too late to pray. It's too late to pray. The opportunity to pray is over. Judas is on his way. Any second, Judas will come in. In fact, the Bible says while he was still talking to them, Judas came in. The time for praying is over. Let me ask you something, mothers, if you're a mother here this morning. When do you think it'll be a good time to start praying for your children? When? When you get a call from the principal? Or when they come in to tell you, well, Mom, I'm pregnant. When are you going to start praying for them? I mean, really praying for them, pouring out your, your heart to God in their behalf. When will you start? Because understand something, there comes a time when it's going to be too late. Oh, you'll want to pray then, but it's too late. Verse 45 tells us that the disciples were sleeping from sorrow. And what this tells us is that this time, this event, completely overwhelmed them. They were overwhelmed by this moment. Prayer was the only hope the disciples had. It was their only hope. Jesus had proven that himself. But they preferred to sleep. They were overcome by the urge to sleep. Look at verse 46. Jesus said to them, why are you sleeping? Why are you sleeping? That's a good question. Why are you sleeping? Paul said, knowing the time. See, that's, that's our problem right there. We don't know what time it is. We don't know how late it is. 
We don't know how soon uh, things are going to change for us, knowing the time that now it's high time to awake out of sleep, for now our salvation is nearer than we ever believed it would be. And Jesus says to the disciples, Get up and pray that you may not enter into temptation. To turn to God in prayer is our only hope. I'm, I'm making an announcement this morning. To turn to God in prayer is our only hope. Okay? Pastor is making an announcement. To turn to God in prayer is our only hope. It's the only hope for our country. Listen to 2 Chronicles 7, 14. If my people, my mother always used to say if was the biggest word in the dictionary. If my people who are called by my name shall humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven and will forgive their sins and heal their land. Friend, my fear is that we're too proud to humble ourselves and we're too self-confident to pray. And if that is true, it is too late for our country. If we are too proud to pray, and too self-reliant and too self-determined to get through this ourselves, then it's too late for our country. What about our city? What about Austin, Texas? The prophet Jeremiah said this. He said, seek the peace of the city where I have caused you to be. And friends, this is the work of a peacemaker, to seek, to seek. You're doing something. You're aggressive in doing it. Seek the peace of the city where I have caused you to be and pray unto the Lord for it. For in the peace thereof shall you have peace. Friends, if there are none who will seek the peace of this city, it is too late for Austin, Texas. It's too late. If there are none who will pray, if there are none who will seek the Lord, who will pour out their heart to God in behalf of this city, it's easy enough to point our fingers at this and that which is wrong, and there are many things about this city which I am concerned deeply about, but am I concerned enough to follow my face before God and seek peace for the city of Austin, Texas? If not, friends, understand clearly it's too late. It's too late for this city. And what about our families? What about our families? I remember Abraham pleaded, pleaded with God. You remember that prayer, if you find 50 righteous, and he kept on praying, 10, and he just kept on praying and praying. For Sodom and Gomorrah. And why in the world did he pray for Sodom and Gomorrah? Because he had family there. He had a wayward nephew, Lot, who lived there with his wife and children. And Abraham cared enough about that wayward nephew. You know, a lot of us just write him off, you know. But he cared enough about that wayward nephew to pray. You know, there may come a time when, it, when it's going to be too late to pray for your children. Just ask David. David had a rebellious son. His name was Absalom. And oh, how he loved Absalom. He had great plans for Absalom. But one day the word came to David that Absalom, your son, is dead. And David began to pray. Oh, Absalom, my son, my son, Absalom, would to God I had died for you. I'm sorry, David, that's not possible. That's not possible for any of us. Well, every mom and dad would gladly give their lives for their child. It's not possible. I think David learned a great lesson that day. In Psalm 32 and verse 6, here's what David says. He said, let everyone who is godly, let everyone who is godly 
pray to you, Father, in a time when you may be found. David profoundly understood that there was a time when it was too late to pray for his precious son, Absalom. There was a time when it was too late to pour out his heart to God. And friends, understand, if there are no parents who will redeem the time and pray for your children, it may just be too late. It may be too late for our little ones. got to pray and finally we need to be praying for ourselves let me give you some good news this morning the Bible says whosoever will call upon the name of the Lord will be saved that's good news whosoever you can clap for that whosoever calls upon the name of the Lord will be saved But you know, there could come a time for you, young man, young lady, may come a time for you when it's too late. The Bible talks about a line that God puts in our lives, a line which we dare not cross. And it's too late to call upon the name of the Lord. But understand this morning, when we pray, when we pray, the Lord will give strength unto his people and the Lord will bless his people with peace. I want to ask you if you just bow your heads there where you are right now, would you please? Every head bowed, every eye closed so we can give God our attention this morning. If you're here and you don't know Jesus as your Savior, you're watching there at home and you don't know Jesus as your Savior, I want to tell you today is the day of salvation. And if you'll call upon the name of the Lord, you can be 